good day gentlemen warm greetings to all viewers from hmt chennai i am captain neeraj and today i will take you all through dual fuel ships uh, part 2 this is the part 2 of the video part 1 was basic and part 2 is going to be advanced in this one we'll start with the engine room machineries we'll talk about their basic uh, working We'll talk about the engine room design. We'll talk about the engine room layout. We are going to talk about uh, our bunker hoses. We are going to talk about the ESD system. We are going to talk about the bunkering operations. And in the end, we will look into the future, how the future for the dual fuel ships looks like. <clears throat> so let's start with the engine room machinery. The main machinery is in the engine room, which consumes your fuel, main engine, auxiliary engine, and your boilers. There are two types of main engines, two, two prominent makers of the in, main engines, MAN and WinCD. MAN, uh, their dual fuel engines are called as MEGI engines. WinCD, their dual fuel engines are called as XDF engines. The broad classification, the broad difference between these two, the MAN engines works on a gas injection pressure of 300 to 450 bar, whereas WinCD, the gas injection pressure is 6 to 16 bar. This is one of the major difference between these two type of engines. So if you happen to be an engineer working on these type of vessels, you need to take care of these basic difference between MAN and WinGD engines. The MAN uh, MEGI engines, they got two fuel injectors. One is for gas and the other one is for pilot fuel, that is your diesel. Both this gas injectors and the diesel injectors are mounted on top of cylinder head. They work on a principle of diesel gas cycle that is a high high pressure system. And diesel is the name of a scientist here. Yeah? So this is the one who invented this process. So man, uh, MEGI engines, as I told you all earlier, they have two injectors. Both the injectors are mounted on top of cylinder head. As the piston compresses the air, the temperature of the air rises. And when it reaches on the top, gas and a small amount of pilot fuel is injected into the cylinder the, and the mixture ignites which leads to the development of a power stroke. Advantage of this type of engines, they have lower methane slip. Methane slip is nothing but the unburnt fuel, fuel and the air mixture which escapes the cylinder is termed as methane slip. So they have a lower methane slip but they will have a higher NOx emissions. Why? Because the time when the fuel and the air is mixing is very less. The mixture is not very homogeneous. In case of wind XDF engines, XDF engines, again, we have two uh, gas injectors. One is for diesel and one is for gas. Here, the location of the gas injector is not on top of cylinder head, but is on the cylinder wall. So diesel injector is on top of cylinder head, whereas gas injector is in the cylinder wall. This works on a principle which is called as auto gas cycle. This is basically a low, a low pressure system. As the piston compresses the air, the gas is injected quite early into the system, quite early into the compression stroke, a pressure of around a maximum 16 bar. And as the piston compresses this fuel and the air mixture, where the temperature is high, a small amount of Diesel is injected on the top, which ignites the mixture and which leads to the development of your power stroke. The advantage of these engines, because the air and the fuel is mixing quite homogeneously, they spend a higher amount of time in the cylinder head. They have lower NOx emissions. The disadvantage of this type of engines, they have higher methane slip. <clears throat> so that is was the your main engine, you know. So the main engine and your wind GD engines, you know, so man engines works on a uh, high working pressure, whereas the wind GD works on a low gas injection pressure system. The man engines, they have both the gas and the diesel injectors mounted right on top of cylinder head, whereas wind GD engines, the XDF engines, the gas injector is mounted in the cylinder wall and the diesel injector is mounted on the cylinder head. These are the basic difference between the man and the wind GD engines. If I talk about auxiliary engines, again, there are various manufacturers of auxiliary engines ranging from Watsela, Yanma, Daihatsu, Rolls Royce, Hyundai, and there are many more players in the market. However, the engine working arrangements, if I have to classify the two arrangements, uh, 
of this, uh, the two types of this type of engines are SG engines and BF engines. Uh, th that's how the Wartzilla calls them. SG engines are basically working on external ignition source. They have a spark plug and they work on a lean burn auto cycle. Whereas the BF type engines, that is the Wartzilla calls them BF engines. They work on a pilot fuel ignition source, dual fuel engines. Both these engines works on five to six bar of gas injection pressures. Most of the Yanmar, Daihatsu, Rolls Royce and Hyundai engines works on a Wartzilla DF principles, whether they have the two gas injection systems. You know, one is a pilot and other one is a gas injection systems. For information, we'll review the Wartzilla SG design. In the SG design, as I told you earlier, we have a spark plug and this works. They have, that is an external ignition source and they work on a principle of lean burn auto cycle. If you look at the uh, Watsila SG design engines, in this process, the gas is mixed with the air before the inlet valves. During the intake period, gas is also fed into a small pre-chamber. At the end of the compression phase, the pre-chamber gas air mixture is ignited by a spark plug and the flame from the nozzle of the pre-chamber pre-chamber ignites the mixture in the whole cylinder. That is how the SG engine works. We have a spark plug and the spark plug is the one which causes the ignition and which generates your power stroke. In the DF engines, what's the DF engines? This is the design of the Yanmar, Daihatsu and Rolls-Royce engines where we have a two fuels. One is a gas fuel and another one is a liquid that is a traditional oil-based fuel. This works again on the lean burn uh, auto cycle. And here, if you look at the four strokes of the engine, the gas is mixed with the air before the intake valve and during the intake period. Once the compression is done, the gas air mixture is ignited by a small amount of liquid pilot fuel and which leads to the development of your power stroke. So again, here, a liquid fuel is spread into the uh, cylinder head, which ignites your, which, uh, ignites your uh, mixture. So this was the auxiliary engine for you all. Now we move on to the next uh, step. That is a piping system for dual fuel ships. This concept will be slightly new for a traditional oil-based uh, oil uh, fuels. Here we'll have two concepts. In one concept, we'll have a double wall fuel pipes. When I say double wall fuel pipes means it is a pipe inside a pipe. This is the pipe which you all are looking here. This is a pipe. And this pipe is the one which is a pipe inside a pipe. IGF code makes it mandatory if the gas pressure inside the pipe is more than 10 bar. So if the gas pressure, the gas which is being carried in the pipe is more than 10 bar, you must use a dual wall fuel pipes. The empty space between the pipe, they have gas detectors and pressure sensors. It can also be purged with nitrogen. So this is the dual wall pipes. In the center pipe, that the pipe which is inside, the gas is being fed to the machineries. The gas is going inside. The outer of the pipe is empty chamber, which has gas detectors and pressure sensors. The entire enclosure is a gas tight. If there is any leak, sensors will detect the leak. The fuel supply will be cut off. The gas supply will be cut off. And an oil supply will start through the separate pipeline. This is a common rail system for main and auxiliary engines. These are the double wall pipes around your main and the auxiliary engines. Single wall pipes under IGF code, if the pressure inside the pipe is less than 10 bar, you are allowed to use a single wall pipe. However, there are add-on requirements. The requirement is the spaces must be ESD protected and there is the requirement of redundancy of machineries and fuel supply system. If you have to classify single wall piping and double wall piping, so the piping arrangement of the fuel from manifold to the storage space, from the storage tank, going to the fuel preparation room is a single wall piping. It means a pipe will be single wall. The black color which you can see on the top is basically the insulation of the pipe. From the fuel preparation room, going all the way to the gas valve unit, from the gas valve unit, going to the machinery is all the way double wall piping. Double wall piping means a pipe inside a pipe. Based upon your machineries and the piping system, you have will have two designs of engine. Why we have this need to have this two layout of the engine? So that in the probability of a gas explosion, so if there is a gas leak, 
my machinery, my engine room will not have any exclusion or fire. So in order to achieve this, my engine room is designed into two, two concepts. Engine room is designed into a ESV protected space, that is ESV protected engine room or a gas safe engine. This is the design of the engine, how your machineries, how your pipelines, how your sensors, how your firefighting systems will be laid in the engine. In one of the design, which is called as a gas safe design, gas safe machinery space, you will have a double wall piping. And if you are having a double wall piping, you will have a ventilation system for your gas valve unit system. No additional requirements are there. There is no requirement to have an explosion proof lighting arrangement. There is no additional requirement for gas detector sensors in the engine. However, if you happen to have a single wall piping system, then there are a number of add-ons requirements. And this arrangement will be termed as ESD protected engine room. You need to have a yeah. intrinsically safe arrangements that is all your light fittings or your machinery fittings must be intrinsically safe you will have a number of gas detector systems gas detectors in the engine room which can activate the esd system which can cut off the fuel supply if they detect the gas that is not one sensors then multiple sensors does that so these are the two designs of the engine room gas safe engine room and the esd protected engine room. now let's look into the Bunker hoses. So bunker hoses are specially designed. Why? Because they are carrying a liquid and this liquid is at a temperature of negative 162 degree Celsius. These bunker hoses have two inherently safe uh, features. One is called as a QC-DC couplings, quick connect and disconnect couplings. And the other one is a ESD couplings. Let's look into the QC-DC couplings. QC-DC couplings stand for quick connect and disconnect coupling, also called as dry disconnect couplings dry breakaway couplings, various nomenclature of this kind of couplings. However, the use of these couplings, these couplings are used to make the connections of hoses to the vessels. They are basically a nozzles. You know, so they do not need a, a bolt and nut arrangement. They are basically a nozzles which goes and sits onto the manifold of the vessels. Mantec is one of the major uh, supplier of these kind of uh, nozzles. So Mantec have uh, two designs. One design is a uh, wheel type and other one is an arm type design. So both the designs are common and both of the designs you can found on your vessels. Uh, you can see in the picture over here, the top one is a round design, which is in operation and one without or in, not in operation. The same with the arm type, which is one is in the operation and another one is not in operation. The next uh, feature of dual fuel ships, ESD system. So what is the ESD system? ESD stands for emergency shutdown systems. ESD system, why we need to have an ESD system? ESD system safely and effectively ends the bunkering operations or the process by stopping the transfer of LNG and vapor between the supplier and supplier. So ESD system once get activated, it will stop the entire transfer system between the two two parties, the bunker supplier and the receiver. So it will stop the bunker transfer operations. ESD system includes ESD parts, the logic and the ESD link. There is basically two computers, one computer on the receiver side, one computer on the supplier side. Both these computers are connected by the use of ESD link, which can be a pneumatic link, which can be a fiber optic link, which can be electric link. And once the computer detects any abnormality, they shut off this valve, they shut off this machinery. If required, they also go and disconnect the hoses automatically. So ESD is two type, ESD level one and level two. Level one is one where all your machineries basically trips. All the machineries from the supplier side and on the receiver side trips and the process is stopped. The bunkering process is stopped. ESD level 2, when this thing happens, it means not only the process will stop, the bunkering process will stop, your valves will stop, your machinery will stop, but also your hoses will get disconnected automatically. The hoses will break apart. When the hoses break apart, there is no leakage of, no major leakage of LNG. Why? Because we got ESD couplings in between. These ESD couplings are working on the pressure, on the basically there is a cam arrangement and this cam locks the hoses at both the end and then they disconnect your hoses. If you look into this uh, images over here, you can see a thin wire that is wrapped around the main hose. That is the ESD link. This is the link which connects both the computer. If they detect the abnormality, they activate the ESD valves. ESD valves closes from both the end and the hoses are disconnected. 
on board your vessel you will find something called as esd cause and effect diagram this will look something similar to that it means what can activate esd your higher tank pressure your gas pressure your uh, tank levels you know 99 percent level this all can trip the esd system that all can activate the esd system manually you can activate the esd system so what can activate the system what can cause the esd and what how the exd will be affected so this diagram please refer to onboard your vessel something called as cause and effect diagram uh, the vessel specific diagram and you must refer to that this is one of the emergency safety systems in this hose the bunker transfer hose can you identify which one is esd coupling and which one is a qcdc coupling the one on the top is a esd coupling this is the coupling which i was talking about earlier this is the place where the hoses will break apart and once the valves are closed so this is the system which have which happens automatically on the top you can also see a thin braided wire this is the esd link which connects both the computers computers from the receiver side and the computers of the supplier side on the bottom the green color one you can see the qcdc coupling quick connect and disconnect couplings this is where your bunker transfer will take place this is a nozzle basically which goes and sit onto the manifold of the supplier and the receiver so that was all about the machineries of the dual fuel ships now we will go on to the practical lng bunkering operations how the bunkering operations on is carried out on this type of vessels a very important feature please pay a quick attention to that three ways of bunkering shore to ship truck to ship or ship to ship one of the three ways you can receive your bunkers each one of them has own advantages and disadvantages when i talk about shore to ship you can get a very large volume at a very high rate the disadvantage here you need to make a port specific call which will cost additional pilotage fare charges and port dues so this is one of the major advantages and disadvantages when you want to receive a bunker from the shore when you want to receive it from the truck again you need a limited shore infrastructure is required delivery is feasible point to point delivery is feasible the disadvantage that is the major disadvantage for ocean liners you can receive small quantity and that also at a very slow rate major disadvantage is when you want to receive bunker from truck to ship conventional way of bunkering that is ship to ship this is the one method which is conventionally being used by seafarers and we all are confident in doing the ship to ship bunkering operations high volumes can be achieved and you can also get it at very high rate the disadvantage in the present 2022 the disadvantage is there are only handful of bunker barges operating worldwide from which you can receive your bunkers before you go and start the bunkering operations bunkering checklist need to be complied with this is one of the sample checklists uh, drawn from international association of port and harbors a similar checklist is also there by uh, society of gas as marine fuel sgmf a, a similar checklist you can also find in your own sms uh, booklets there are 22 elements in your checklist as a viewer i will request you all to pause the video here and go into each of these 22 elements that are safety critical you must check this 22 elements prior you start your bunkering operations you know in all the checklists whether you take a checklist of your company whether you take a checklist from sgmf these 22 elements will be included into that practical bunkering operations so there are bunkering operations is divided into nine steps right from hose connection to inerting of hoses followed by purging and cooling down starting that is ramp up operations topping up stopping the bunkering operations draining of bunker lines purging and finally disconnection there are nine steps in the bunkering operations we'll go into each steps one by one step one that is hose connection so remember how many hoses will be connected there will be two hoses that will be connected generally one will be liquid and one will be vapor there will be a third link that will be connected that is termed as esd link and what is the purpose of esd link connecting the two computers one computer from the supplier and one computer from the receiver esd link will do that do that uh, connection of the computers what is content inside the hose the hose content is an ambient air what is the temperature of the hose again ambient temperature can we start our bunkering operation 
The answer is no. We cannot start our bungling operation now. Why? Because if I mix LNG with this air, a very flammable mixture can be formed. And again, the temperatures are not ready for loading. There we can have a brittle fracture. The whole hose can get damaged. So how to make our hoses ready for transfer? So step number two, inerting of hoses. So what I will do? The first thing, I will remove the flammable air from the hoses. I will remove the air from the hoses so that when LNG passes through it, a flammable mixture does not form. So how to do that? So the supplier side, the receiving ship, will use its nitrogen plant and will let the nitrogen pass through its hoses and it will be vented out into the atmosphere on the supplier south. This is called as inerting of hoses. So did I manage to remove the air from the hoses? Yes. Now the hoses are mixed with, uh, now the hoses have inert gas that is a nitrogen inside them. Temperature is also slightly lower than the ambient temperature. But again, temperature, it is not ready for loading, not ready for your bunkering operations. So now how to make the temperature close to your bunkering? This step, that is step three, called as gassing up and cooling down. In this step, what we do is, a small amount of bunker LNG vapors is being passed through the, through the hoses from the supplier side going into the receiver side. This is a slow step. This is process is performed gradually. And this is what takes a very long time if your tanks are not ready, if your tanks are not in the cold state. This is process is going to take, can take up to 24 hours, just gassing up and cooling down if your tanks are not in the cold state. What we do here, here we take a small amount of LNG vapors from the supplier side and this vapors travel through the hoses, goes into the receiver side. What is the effect? The, your hoses now will have LNG vapors and the temperature will gradually fall and it will achieve a transfer, a transfer a temperature that will be close to negative 160 degree Celsius. Now, once my hoses are ready, once my tanks are ready, now I'll start the bunkering operation at a very slow rate. And then later on, I will increase my bunkering rate. And this will be called as ramp up. Ramp up is a process. Ramp up is a word which we use on board the vessel when we increase our bunkering rate. Step number five, topping up. Here we ramp down. It means we reduce the bunkering rate and we achieve a slower rate into my tanks. This is the topping up of my tanks. Step number six, stopping of the bunkering operations. So once I achieve, once I re receive the designated uh, amount, the bunkering operations are stopped. Please understand the hoses are having liquid LNG now. I will not close all the valves. I will only close the valves which are bare minimum required. My valves, the lineups are still open and now I will drain the hoses. So the moment I close the valves in such a way that the liquid will vaporize into, will convert into vapor and this vapor will go back into the tanks, in the respective tank. So this is an automatic process. You just need to close the valves. You just need to do the lineup. LNG will automatically, because of the effect of the atmospheric temperature, it will convert into uh, vapor and it will flow back into respective tanks. This will again take a slight amount of time. But it is uh, very important before we go and do the disconnection. It is equivalent to stripping of the lines. Now, once LNG vapors are there in your uh, hoses, the liquid has been vaporized into vapor. Now, what you need to do again from the receiving ship, nitrogen will be purged into the hoses to get rid of the flammable LNG vapors. So nitrogen is passed through your hoses and all the flammable LNG vapors are get rid from the hoses, are removed from your hoses. Step nine, finally, we go ahead and do the disconnections. Once we see that the gas reading is less than 2% by volume, that is a methane gas reading. So these are the basically the nine steps which are involved in the bunkering steps, irrespective of the type of the vessel, irrespective of the size of the vessels. These nine steps must be followed on to your on in your vessels when you do your bunkering process. If I talk about the timeline, uh, let's look about the timeline of a smaller vessel that is 100 cubic of LNG bunkering. A typical time frame required is about 60 minutes for a smaller vessel 100 cubic of LNG bunkering. But if I talk about a ocean going um, container vessel, say 23,000 uh, TU container vessel, uh, this bunkering operation happened in 2022, that is January 2022 in Singapore. This vessel is bunkering for the first time 
in Singapore, the vessel was at berth for about 58 hours and the bunkering operation surprisingly took 53 hours. As an engineer working on these type of vessels, are we used to have a bunkering operation of 53 hours long? Let's look into the timeline in detail. If you look into the detail, the cool down, the cool down operation took how many hours? 24 hours. The pumping time took only 13 hours, which was a, a conventional, uh, which is common for conventional vessels, but cooling down operation took 24 hours. So working on dual fuel ships, the bunkering operations are going to be prolonged. Please keep it in mind. Huh? They are going to be prolonged, especially if you are going, if your tanks are not into the cold state, if you are bunkering for the first time, it is going to be taking a very, very long amount of time. If you're taking the tanks out of the service or you are putting the tanks into the service, it means if you are going into the dry dock or you are coming out of dry dock, again, there are additional number of uh, additional steps are required to prepare your tank and this will take further more time. So that's all about LNG bunkering operations. I hope uh, you all had some idea about the LNG bunkering, how these bunkerings are happening on board your vessels. If you talk about uh, other than LNG, what are the fuels which we are using on, uh, uh, we will be using in future or what are the other alternatives for LNG? So LPG is one of the alternatives which is being used nowadays. Uh, many of the vessels are working on LPG propulsion as well. Methanol, ethanol, ammonia, hydrogen, there are a number of fuels which are coming up and, and LPG is one fuel, uh, BW is one of the company basically where majority of their LPG vessels are propelled, are having the dual fuel systems working on LPG. They don't have LNG systems, they have LPG system and the system is working very efficient for the, their BW LPG fleet. If you talk about methanol, methanol is catching up. Uh, recently, Musk has ordered about four container vessels will, will be delivered in 2024 that will be powered by methanol. Uh, just uh, recently, that is in June 2022, uh, Stena Propratia, you know, a 49,000 uh, ton uh, deadweight tanker uh, was delivered and Stena is the one who is uh, operating these vessels, operating on methanol, you know. And if you talk about ammonia, this is one of the gray area as of now, there are only vessels on research and development purpose. There is no uh, vessel sailing with ammonia propulsion system as of now. Uh, by information for the viewers, IMO is also working on a separate code for ammonia propelled vessels. Ammonia is quite uh, toxic. Uh, for your information, MOL also is working on a research and development project for ammonia powered vessels. Uh, Norway cruise company Color Fantasy also working with a pilot project for ammonia fuel uh, vessels. Uh, hydrogen, uh, if, you, if you see the future, uh, it is one of the very promising fuel. It is a carbon neutral fuel which has no carbon element into it. Uh, the major challenge here, carriage temperature negative 252 degrees Celsius. However, all these challenges are overcome uh, this year itself. You know, a Susi Frontier, you know, a vessel uh, which was uh, delivered in January 2022, uh, transported the first consignment of hydrogen from Australia to Japan. Although the vessel uh, has a very unfortunate uh, fire incident a uh, few months back and it was out of service for a long uh, time. You know? So things are uh, working for the future. Let's see what will uh, come up. Uh, another way is the bio battery propulsion system. So UECC, United European Car Company, you know, so this is a PCTC vessels, mostly PCTC vessels are there in their fleet. And uh, most of their hotel load, you know, they are working with the battery. Their hotel load, they are managed to shift onto the battery. You know? So this is something new, which is happening in the industry battery propulsion system. If I talk about the major challenges, uh, what other fuels are going to fuse uh, as a comparison with LNG and when they competitive with LNG, the first major challenge which these fuels are going to face when competing with LNG is the space they need on board the vessel. It means the endurance of the vessel. For example, say to cover one nautical mile, a vessel needs say 0.57 cubic of oil based fuels. Then in term of LNG, it will need one cubic. In terms of ammonia, it will need a higher amount that is 1.45 cubic. In terms of methanol, it will need 1.5 cubics. And in terms of hydrogen, it will need 2.6 cubic. Just to travel one single nautical mile. This is just for example, I'm just giving one reference. So if you compare with to travel one nautical mile, you need one cubic of LNG. If you talk about hydrogen, you need 2.6 cubic. 
So where you are going to keep this hydrogen on board the vessel? Do you have the space to keep this amount of fuel on board your vessels? Let's look into the challenges, you know. So very interesting um, research that has come up with one of the classification societies. So this is one of the, the vessel on the top is an LNG propelled uh, vessel. So you have two additional tanks on the deck. But now if you are migrating to any other fuel, whether it is ammonia or methyl, you need two additional tanks. And if you happen to have a nitrogen, uh, sorry, if you happen to have a, a hydrogen based fuel, then you need to double up the space. You will have to have a, about six or seven of these kind of uh, tanks on you on main deck of your vessel. So do all the ships will have this kind of space to carry the fuel, you know, so instead of carrying the cargo, you will be carrying the fuel, you know, so that is one of the challenges which industry is facing. Our industry is basically at a crossroad, you know, which way we will go, nobody can give us a definite answer, you know, which fuel will lead us to 2050, nobody has the answer of this fuel, everybody is uh, at a crossroad. We are at a same juncture where our forefathers were there, in the end of the 18th century when we migrated from coal to oil, and now we are migrating from oil to gas. No, and finally, we will move into a future where we will have a zero carbon emission, so zero carbon emitting fuels. However, what will lead us there? As of now, the solution is LNG, which is technologically, economically, and has far better environmental footprints. So LNG is one of the very promising fuel for the future. LNG is uh, infrastructure around the coast are increasing. They are uh, number of the order of the fuel of uh, LNG fuel vessels is also double. As of now, the total number of barges operating worldwide, about 25 to 30 odd barges are operating worldwide. LNG fuel vessels, almost 300 vessels are there uh, on order that will be delivered in the coming years. There is a very strong demand of LNG in the coming years. If you talk about uh, what is going to happen in the next decade, next decade is definitely going to be ruled by LNG. Is uh, for although other fuels are going to catch up, but LNG is definitely going to be the leader until the end of the next decade. But what will happen after 2050 and beyond, where we are able to achieve our uh, deadline of reducing the carbon footprints by less than 50 percent? You know, we have to control our emissions up to 50 percent of CO2 emissions by 2050. Whether we are able to achieve it by LNG. That is something which we don't know. That is something where our uh, industry leaders, that is where our uh, lot of researchers and developers are working in this project. But uh, let's see what the future hold us, you know, where the future will take us. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. This uh, brings us to the end of our uh, part two of the video. Uh, for your information, at HIMT, we are having both the courses, basic IGF and advanced IGF. Both are five days uh, course. And uh, for detail, you can refer to hmtmarine.com. I'm Captain Neeraj, and uh, I am uh, signing off right now. I hope you managed to learn something new from my video. Uh, I welcome all your feedbacks at uh, the below mentioned uh, email IDs. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great day.